Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 524, that's cinco, dos, cuatro, say it again, cinco, dos, cuatro, of the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, como estas, mi amigos, bien, cool, great, Tambien, nos vemos. All that malarkey. Hope you're well wherever this may meet you. I am doing absolutely perfect. As you can tell, I'm in a jolly, jovial mood. I've had a bit of green juice. I've had a little bit of bacon. I've had some avocados. I'm doing my keto. I've got my white t-shirt on, which you know already, that's a sign that the pounds are coming off because I don't wear white until those pounds come off because when you wear white and you're a bit lumpy, those little boobies, right, the little man titties, they end up bouncing around, innit? So you have to wear the black or the other colors to kind of suppress your chest. But when your chest is flattening and you're doing the press-ups and you're doing the benches and the presses and whatnot and the back squats and all this good shit, you want to wear white. You want to start wearing stuff a bit more clingy. Don't get me wrong, this is a bit of a TI old school, you know, rapper t-shirt size. But still, I can wear white without feeling like my side profile looks like a lumpy Michelin man. And I'm so happy about that, obviously. And obviously the green juice and all that good stuff. But you know me. I like to wear cool clothes. I like to look fancy. So my main goal is to be as skinny as possible. Skinny Legend Agostino is back again. That's why I'm happy. That's why I'm good. Regardless, don't care what you are, how big or small you are, I'm just glad you're here and you're supporting me. I'm so, so thankful for that. For those of you who are watching via the YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your family and friends. Even a four, even a three, even a two, even a one, I do not care. And of course, my Patreon subscribers who I cherish so dearly for you, you know, um, breaking or separating yourself from your hard-earned money that you've kind of sweated all flipping year around to make for me little old me so big up you i really appreciate you patreon supporters only one pound equivalent of one dollar per week there's other tiers too but what i include on there is one piece of bonus content every single week the next one is dropping at the end of this week i'm gonna have some really good bonus footage for you there for you guys to be listening to and watching so make sure if you're not on the patreon that you subscribe at patreon.com for slash agostino many many more things coming on patreon only so definitely get on there don't delay at patreon.com for slash agostino so you get one bonus episode per week as well as a live stream stream only well a live stream video basically only for patreon subscribers you won't find any of those clips on my any other channels or any other place only it lives on patreon so if you want all that gated community sort of stuff and you want to give back and you want to contribute and you want to support what i'm doing and you want to help fund my ability to buy a mercedes amg then make sure you jump on that patreon at patreon.com for slash agostino all the details can be found in the description of this video as well as the description of the podcast don't delay get on it today but yeah, here I am, back again, back in the sector, feeling good, feeling brave. As per usual, I'm in a great mood because things outside of me that I have no control of are going well. Number one thing being, I'm actually on the way or preparing before I record this podcast to go to a Christmas party. I'm going to an employment place Christmas party and to me, it's blowing my mind. More so because of just how hard the last 18 months has been right, maybe the last year and a half, right, it's so difficult, well, not, let's say the last year of being unemployed was just one of those situations that I really started to kind of wonder if maybe my luck was up, not that I was never going to get a position again, but just wondering, maybe my luck is up, maybe I have to go right down to the bottom and go right down to where I started in terms of the service industry, so the working in bars and work my way up again, because I was having no luck, absolutely zero, zero luck trying to apply for the jobs that I actually wanted to do, where, you know, in various industries you know like marketing customer service online branding influencer marketing social media management all the stuff that i've got flipping experience on i wasn't finding jobs at all in those lanes but i was finding loads of people getting back to me for sales assistant roles in tesco's sales assistant roles in wilco sales assistant roles in jd sports and adidas whatever those things were giving me much more indication that they would be willing to employ me even though in the end they didn't then the ones in the offices, which I was trying to aim for because those are what my larger my bits in my experience were. And obviously those are the ones that are also going to allow me to have the most monetary gain in the time that I was doing it in order to kind of help me fund all my other stuff that I was doing. But then I was wondering to myself, you know what, all this bad luck I'm having, this run of just sending out applications and they're going into deep space, because that's one of the most really demoralizing things about job applications or applying for jobs in general is that kind of 
drudge the first couple of months where you're just sending out tons of emails, tons of covering letters, you're attaching everything and you're just getting no reply. Sometimes you, know, you don't even get an acknowledgement that they've even received it. It just goes whoosh, into deep space. And then you're like, whoa. And then sometimes a few months later, they get a reply back saying, oh, the position's now been forwarded. And it's like, huh? They didn't even acknowledge you at the time. And you just feel so worthless. You feel so empty. You feel as if like your luck isn't going to change because you're thinking to yourself, more likely than not, it's kind of similar to like trying to pick up somebody, right? Or trying to hook up with a girl or whatever, right? You're, more, you're, you're in your head. If you're a sensible guy, you know more often than not, if the person is somewhat attractive, doesn't matter physically or personality, then they probably got options, right? Especially if they're a, a very attractive person, both on the inside and outside. So, you know, if you're getting a cold shoulder, or you're getting the scene, you're getting left on scene, or you're just getting aired in general, it's usually not a personal thing. It's usually because they've either got other options or they've got stuff going on in their life that they just haven't got time to get around to you. But you know they're in demand in some way, shape or form. So it kind of makes you feel a little bit better about yourself, right? You don't, you're not so defeated, but you're a little bit better. But flip it the other way, and when you try and approach somebody, you're trying to hook up with somebody, and they're not giving you any blight. They're not even they're not even opening your messages. They, they're just giving you a complete cold shoulder. That can really start making you question <laughs> your sanity, make you question everything about yourself. It really does have a serious debilitating effect on you. And I think the employment thing is even worse than hooking up for him because you can go without life. With, you can go through life without hooking up with somebody. It's not the be on end of life, right? It really isn't. Especially the older you get, you start to realize, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just not that, it's not, it's not that important. But when you're unemployed and you have no way of feeding yourself, no way of putting clothes on your back, no way of keeping a roof over your head, no way of keeping the bailiffs away. Wow. You will start questioning everything about your life choices. Everything. Again, if you're somebody that has, if you're somebody that uh, isn't a narcissist, that obviously does understand that you have played some part in the position that you're in at the moment. Because, you know, I know a lot of people have gone through unfortunate circumstances where like, even I had a similar sort of thing where during COVID or during the lockdown, you know, certain companies will get rid of you because they went to downsize. In my case, it was less so about that and more so just not me, just not being up to the job and not being doing it really well. So they decided, you know what, go and jump or go to the street and kick rocks. But most people kind of got let go because of COVID stuff and, you know, stuff out of your control. But there are, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in being the kind of person that accepts all responsibility, even when it's not your fault, because it's far easier to deal with that way than to just, deal. yeah, it's far better to, I find it a far easier thing to resolve by just taking on the responsibility on myself then trying to assert blame or trying to divvy up blame to external factors that I can't control. So even if I didn't get myself in a position where my company let go, let me go because of COVID, I'll still say, why did I decide to move that at the time? Why didn't I prepare beforehand? Why wasn't I, uh, you know, uh, sending out applications prior to me getting let go? Because you know it was pretty obvious that the world was going to change when COVID hit. Right? No one was caught off guard for, for the most part especially after a year you can't say it was a surprise anymore you had to make the necessary uh, adjustments some people decided to live outside of the city to downsize some people decided to maybe start a family some people did loads of different things to kind of you know get themselves prepared for this kind of weird space we're going in at the moment so you can't necessarily say it caught you by surprise so there are elements of it that could be your fault and i think that's a far better way to kind of step forward into the kind of new reality or the quote unquote new normal but it's still really hard to get over. It really, really hard to get over, especially during COVID, because it seemed like, for the most part, because it's twofold. It can seem like it's always happening to you, but then when you look at the outside and you just open your window or you just read the news or whatever, you start to realize, no, everyone is hurting out there. Doesn't matter what level of job you're working at, you're being stretched really thin. Even if you're working at a really high level where you are in terms of you're one of the executives, you're probably being stretched, stretched really thin because you don't really have the resources to employ other people to kind of divvy out the work that you'd usually do. All the demands of people above you are really, really high and strong and they're pushing you to the brink, which is now giving you confidence to people that you're kind of um, leading, your kind of quote subordinates. If you're on an entry level job, you're of course doing the job of 17 different people. I know I've only have to I don't have to look at my example I use all the time is my local Weatherspoons. You know, some of the girls that work there that I see when I pop in some of the times on the weekend, like they are busting their ass, bruv. They are working so hard because effectively no one wants to do those jobs anymore. Because I guess the pay isn't that great anyway. 
And during COVID, people have realized, especially if you're working entry level jobs or service level, service industry level jobs, you don't necessarily need that much money to survive, right? You don't need to be busting your ass working weather spoons for 900 quid a, a month. If you could just earn maybe a similar amount working, or if you just earn similar amount um, claiming benefits from universal credit and then maybe do some cash under the table sort of, or cash in hand, sorry, sort of deals in terms of working in restaurants to kind of supplement your income make more than enough to kind of continue on that way people are basically doing that finesse because you know they just fed up with it and i already mentioned it the whole anti-work movement thing happening at the moment so people's idea or kind of expectations um of work and the demands have kind of changed drastically over the last few years and i personally think it's been very refreshing to see but of course it's led to very difficult circumstances for people like myself like i was unemployed for a good i think eight was it eight nine months it felt maybe longer i was down in the dumps i wasn't cutting my hair i think if you just rob scroll back to some old footage of my podcast maybe a year before yeah maybe a year from today you'll see i was i looked horrible i was fat as hell i was wearing the same clothes every single day i didn't leave my bed I was watching movies upon movies upon movies back to back like seven in a row just so I can didn't have to think about my um, immediate future um, or, or my, or, you know, my basically my present that I was kind of going through. But then I had to just kind of pull myself up from that and basically say, unfortunately, like all job applications or like anything you want in life, the only way to kind of get out of it is just to keep on moving constant momentum that's the only thing you can do and again it's debilitating it's horrible it makes you go into depression into a funk but the only thing you can do is just to continue applying even if you're not getting any replies even if you're getting those really weird replies that are telling you to fucking write an essay or to jump and to skip in order to kind of apply for a job whatever it may be just keep applying just keep going keep going do not stop because sooner rather than later the momentum will swing back your way and you'll suddenly get offers and again it was no surprise for me as soon as I started to just continue doing as I was doing prior, suddenly I started to get offers for second stage interviews, first stage interviews, final stage interviews even. Before the place I, I joined now at the moment, I had a position kind of basically lined up where they told me to get references and stuff. And one of the only times in my job application process, um, I was rejected from a job after giving the references. But I know, I think I Googled it. It's pretty normal. Um, references don't mean you're going to get the job. I think I was under the assumption that if you give someone a reference, it means you're going to get the job. But usually in every job application I've been through, you go through the normal rounds. Da, 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 you talk to people. You maybe send some examples of your work, whatever it may be. And then the last step that they ask you is, oh, references, please, before they send you an offer. It's usually just to kind of like, you know, uh, just to kind of uh, dot their I's and cross their T's. But this is the first time ever in my kind of career they said no, right? Once I get references, it was like, oh, and again, if you know anything about having two references, that's always a ball ache because you don't want to, you don't want to trouble anybody, especially people you haven't spoken to in ages. It's just a bit of a nightmare. So that obviously got put to the back burner. But then another role came up, which is the one I'm in at the moment that came up immediately, which I kind of was able to kind of seal within two weeks from the start of the interview to basically get offered the job and start in basically two and a half weeks, basically. So <laughs> that again, I think mostly came not because I'm amazing, not because I've had the luck of Charlie on me or whatever right no none of that i just think because of momentum i just kept going i didn't give up and i think you honestly you need to do that and again i think another part of it for all my creatives out there i was very much a person who took employment for granted i have to say that honestly with my chest um or kind of being honest and fessing up to it i took jobs for granted i kind of acted like i was above them like they were beneath me i think a lot of my former colleagues who worked with, worked with me in other places will probably attest to that especially the last few places i've worked at which ended really badly um because i just didn't really care about them i kind of felt as if i was above them that i didn't need to do them and i was it was just kind of a means to an end because my real goal was to dj my real goal was to do podcasting full-time my real goal was to have my brand my real goal was to have my store my real goal was to have my, what, all these stuff i want to do right that was my real goal so everything i was doing was just to kind of fund those real goals but i found over again having having to suffer with being unemployed for what six seven eight nine months however long it was again it was so distressing you know when you uh, and, uh, and a, a, you know when an occasion in your life is so distressing that you kind of memory hole it you just kind of like blank it out and you make it muddled so you can't really put down the dates you know what the dates are but you can't put it down because if you put it down it's gonna start making you remember all the really frightening bits you had to go through so anyway but as a side but what i've kind of realized over the years or what i've realized over this time especially during lockdown especially during covid has been or leaving lockdown and obviously being in COVID times, I think, especially if you're a creative, you have to kind of abide by the moniker or abide by the saying earned leisure. And I think I read it in a book somewhere. I forgot which book I read it. But the idea of earned leisure is essentially like 
the idea it's like a humble idea of like toiling the fields in order for you to then enjoy your weekends with your wife with your children with your friends with your community you know what i mean that's what it means like or, or doing your hobbies so toil the fields work that 12 hour shift bust your ass right like come in every single day with a good positive attitude try and be a uh, a solid member of the team put your best foot forward you know what I mean? All that good stuff. And then at the weekends, when you've got your time off, wherever that time off is, two weeks, hence, three, it doesn't matter. Then go and enjoy yourself and really let your hair down. But earned leisure. And I think if you're creative, you have to have a, a bit of earned leisure too. Um, you're not going to be able, you know, a, a, a design studio isn't going to fall in your lap. A DJ career isn't going to fall in your lap. Working in music isn't falling in your lap. This dream career one isn't going to fall in your lap, right? Wherever it is, design, whatever. It's not going to fall in your lap. You're going to have to bust your ass in the job that you have that's allowing you the ability to buy notepads, to buy laptops, attend shows, to go to conferences. All that money that you're earning from your job is allowing you to do, to even go to do shows on weekend like I was doing. I was DJing Thursday, Friday before the pandemic. Sometimes I fly to different places. I'll use the money and the holidays I got for my job to allow me to do a booking in Berlin, for instance, right? So, but the job was the, the, was the bread and butter. That was what's kind of allowed me to do those other things. But I took it for granted. And as per usual with the universe, it came and slapped me around the face during the pandemic and said, okay, you take your jobs for granted. Here you go. No job for you then. Luckily, I had savings and stuff. And obviously, I had some coins coming in from YouTube that was grateful for that. And whatever speckling of dollars I had coming in for Patreon. But I was really on the edge of the of disaster let's say financial disaster before that last job came in and it really made me kind of believe like you know made me kind of realize you know what you have to respect jobs you have to respect employment especially if you're starting up getting your feet getting your feet on the table and again not everyone's journey is the same some people are lucky where they're able to just work a couple of months in a job do a do do a little project and boom it blows up suddenly they're on the cover of fucking whatever magazine they do this and moving forward they've got an agent and, they, and they're gone they're blown but most of us don't don't have that luck. Most of us have to really work hard. We have to bust our ass. We have to sweat. And we have to kind of get our get our hands dirty, and then then maybe we have the possibility to kind of um have our dream career. And sometimes it doesn't work out either. I have all these dreams, aspirations I want to do, but sometimes it doesn't work out. It sometimes it won't. Sometimes it just won't. It just is what it is, right? But I'm trying to put my best foot forward and trying to put what try and do as much as I can do to go get closer to my dreams. But when you have a good attitude with the work that you're doing in terms of the employment, I don't care what job it is, what then it allows you to do, if that other career you want outside of uh, regular nine to five doesn't work out, you have a good base for you to kind of progress in whatever job you're doing in at the moment, right? You have a, And you have a good kind of mindset too at the time when you're doing it too. You're not like kind of looking for the exit. I can't wait, man. One more month. I'm not going to be until Christmas. That's what I used to be. I used to be that kind of guy. Nah, this is the last job I'm going to have when I quit here. Yeah, all that sort of stuff is just unnecessary. Just work the job, take the money that you're doing for your job, invest it in your art, keep kind, of, keep keep putting your money where your mouth is. Because a lot of people don't do that too. They love doing the whole, you know, how I was. They love doing the whole Photoshop line sheets and using PSD files to explain your dreams and stuff. No, no, no. Put your money where your mouth is. Open that store. Start that brand. Um, put on that night. Book those DJs. Whatever it may be. Put your money where your mouth is with the employment money you have, and just keep going back and forth back and forth back and forth and then if that thing pops off and it blows up then cool quit the job but let's not take our jobs for granted my creative people let's not take our jobs for granted okay that's my p uh, that's my uh, tedx tedx or whatever rah rah self-help talk out of the way um over the weekend what i got up to i went to inferno i went to inferno and by their instagram bio they are a london-based queer techno rave performance art platform founded and curated by lewis g burton and oh my god was it fun was it fun legitimately one of the funnest raves i've been to in a long time and again it wasn't rambunctious it wasn't water wall people it wasn't like all the music i'm pretty much used to it was a completely different crowd but it was legitimately one of the funnest places i've been to and even though everyone looks incredibly cool and you'd think they're gonna be really pretentious and up their own ass it might have been on my again my opinion still again i've been to many raves so don't i don't know where how many you wanna you wanna take my opinion you know as gospel whatever i legitimately think this might have been the nicest group of people I've ever met in a party, especially in a party that I felt, you know, severely underdressed in, right? Something that I felt inadequate in, actually. I actually feel like, God damn it, man, I should have made an effort. 
Like, such a good party, such a fun party. First of all, it's located at the Colour Factory, formerly known as Mixed Garage, which is in Hackney Wick. Nice little area there, little square where there's nice little clubs. There's the yard, there's that, there's Colour Factory. There's a great pub that does also great pizzas. There's down the road another bar too. I forgot the name of it. But it's a cool little square. If you want to go out to rave and hang out, have a good time in East London, I really recommend going to that little Hackney Wick area. So I've been going to the Kyle Factory or formerly Mixed Garage for a while now. When it was Mixed Garage, they had mostly, you would say, your typical kind of Night Tales kind of promotion. I would imagine that whoever does Night Tales probably was the same booker that did uh, Mixed Garage because the nights were fairly simple, right? Like, deep house house techno sort of nights uh playing there so kind of the familiar sort the familiar sort of lineup but whoever took over the color factory has definitely uh decided to flip it on its head and change the entire booking because all i see are all these kind of what i would term to be again no it's not to, to be derogatory it's just kind of how i'd class it quote unquote alternative club nights um, but they're also giving them the platform to do it at that kind of level, at that scale in those kind of clubs. Because usually these kind of nights like Inferno would usually, in the times gone by when I was coming up promoting nights, they would usually be in pubs and bars, right? They'd be like in, you'd go, you'd hire a pub and a bar, you'd get your own door stuff and you'd kind of make your own little thing. But you'd rarely see these kind of parties at like a Corsica, at like an Esco, XOYO, and E1, at a Fabric, at a Fold. They didn't, they didn't really happen, no, not Fold's not a good example, but you know what I mean? They didn't really happen in those kind of spaces. That's why probably the places like the cores are so important because they they are really good at sort of having an extremely varied lineup, right? They go from drum and bass to jungle, the bass to disco to house to techno, all of it covered. But most clubs are not like that. Most clubs kind of stick to the what's tried and true, like all the resident advisors of top one hundred DJ lists or DJ Mag top one hundred list kind of music, right? Deep house, house house resident variations, and then all the other spaces do all the other quote alternative nights. But it's really great to see. These spaces allow people like this to be able to put on nights at the level or on the same platform as all these other big kind of promotions to basically prove the concept that as long as these people are able to apply them, so as long as you're able to play on the same field, you can also compete. Because I think for a long time, people would think, oh, uh, these people who are playing at these sort of nights are not at the level of those bigger things, playing at the bigger festivals. That's why they're playing at a level. No, it's not because of that. It's because the system is rigged for the most part. There's a kind of, it's sort of like a gated institution, right? I wouldn't call it a boys club, but it is a little bit like, you know, if you know, to, if you know someone, you know somebody, you get in that way. I've heard of DJs making it. Like there's one good example. I forgot the DJ's name. who was essentially a dealer. Of somebody in a deep house scene or is it Tickles? Yeah, did deep no, sorry, the what would you call it? Ah. Oh, deep house scene. Yeah, deep this is a deep house scene. So there's a big DJ in there. His dealer basically started getting interested into dealing and so started getting interested into DJing because of just dealing to this guy. Started DJing on the side just as a hobby. And then because he's known to to the DJ guy, he got a book or two, and now he's like, you know, touring the world and living his best life. <laughs> But only because he kind of has that kind of in. So it's not really, you can't say it's always earned. Um, it's kind of like favours. It is what it is. But then what I would always argue is that fair enough that the game is rigged, but also allow me to play my game on my side, right? That's the only problem because they'd kind of relegate these sort of nights to the bars and clubs and they'd let all the commercials, you just kind of populate all the clubs and there's no way of you kind of breaking in there. And also for the punters, it's boring because there's no way to kind of get fresh new people playing in front of you. It's always the same old boring, boring people. So the fact that they're doing this is incredible. They're giving them the platform. And of course, when they get given the platform, guess what they do? They fucking throw that shit out of the park. I miss the shows, um, whatever, because usually they have like a little performance show. It's always amazing. They have a really cool artist, performance artist doing it, doing interesting pieces and whatnot. They have great DJs who they don't really announce a bit before, ahead of time, I don't think. It's usually people like friends and family. And then, of course, the people that attend are dressed to the nines. Like, this is legitimate club kid shit. Legit and again, it's so... I guess I was so unprepared because, again, I'm a fucking club nightlife, you know, fiend. But because of all the books and accounts and interviews I've read from the past, it feels like this is like a bygone era, right? The club kid thing kind of has gone away. But for whatever reason, in the last few years, there's been a resurgence of this kind of performance um, aspect when it comes to going out. This kind of um, this kind of need to express yourself and your ideologies and your view on life and your moods and your passions through your clothing. This idea that you know clubbing isn't just about going out and getting smacked and you know whatever, going out and getting flipping 
high as a flipping kite and hooking up with random strangers. Of course, some of that is probably still happening, but there is another part of it, which is just the pure liberation, the ability to kind of be in a space with people that are just like you, share similar interests and kind of be in a quote unquote, what would you say? Safe space, right? A place that you can kind of be your unbridled or authentic self, you know, to the max. And they're doing it to the absolute max. And I have to be honest, it was absolutely banging, man. All of it. Okay, they have the lineup here, but I didn't. I missed that. But yeah, banging, 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 banging. Really, really, really good. I absolutely enjoyed it, man. I really had a good time. Um, I met so many cool people. I did a few people on Instagram here and there. Um, for the people that I was uh annoying by telling you how amazing you were dressed and how underdressed i felt please excuse me that was just my insecurities coming out you know when you're insecure you try and uh self-deprecate yourself to an extent where it just gets a bit annoying so i know that was happening quite often but i was just sat down for the most part i, I spent some time on the stage then i spent some time at the bar talking to the bartenders just like just just kind of observing and kind of soaking it all in and wow man what a great night honestly i cannot have any more good words to say about inferno like i said if you're interested or if you're kind of just bored of the regular club scene and you want to see what's kind of going on in in london's i wouldn't say underbelly because i really do believe this sort of next these sort of like next set of promoters that are coming up at the moment are going to be the next sort of wave who kind of dictate the next sort of flow of what's going on in club land i think overall people are going to get bored of the same old business technology just playing in the same old places because again they have a purpose i think when you go to shows like in print works you see where those kind of DJs kind of have a purpose, right? In those kind of platforms, those kind of space, even some of that, f that fabric, that there's platforms and places where it's kind of necessary to see those people play at those sort of stages because they really know how to do those stages really well. But then also the other spaces, I would also like to see some variety. I want to see somebody different that's on a, on, a, on a DJ lamp, somebody new that I haven't heard of, different people in the, in the space surrounded by you. It's nothing. There's nothing better than that, especially for me, who's, again, a guy who's gone to the Colour Factory, formerly Mixed Garage, for a long, long time. To be in that space, be surrounded by people that I've never seen that space beforehand was really cool. I have to be honest, really, 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 really cool. And I really recommend you check it out. Um, When I went, of course, it was interesting too, a little bit of an end to end it there. It was a bit of a mindfuck to be actually, to go to a London club and have a door picker. That was absolutely really cool. So there was this girl um, who was at the door making sure no kind of randoms got in. As I was approaching, unfortunately, a big group of like white dudes tried to get in and she said, obviously, no, um, you know, just to kind of make sure they protect the space and make sure the people are in there kind of feel comfortable because they didn't want too many, I guess, hetero vibes in there, which I completely understand. Luckily, they permitted me to go in. I think it helped because I was on my own. Don't get me wrong. Um, maybe the skin color helped too. I don't think so. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think not. I just think because I was on my own and I was kind of well behaved and I looked maybe like I could kind of blend in that maybe I was allowed to go in. That was great. But it was a bit of a mindfuck to see a door picker in london because we don't have that culture at all which is why our club scene is a bit you know hit and miss it's something obviously they do in berlin really well and in other sort of places around europe but that idea of like making sure you kind of cultivate the space and ensure that people in there feel comfortable because essentially we're in their house isn't it this is their house it's not my house this is their house i'm a guest so i just want to make sure that they don't feel like you know you're impeding in anything and wow man I have to be honest, wow, what an incredibly fun night. I have to be honest, really, really fun night. I was gutted it ended too quickly. Ended at 4 a.m. I only got there like half 12, I think. So my L in that regard. Can't wait to go again. When I do go, I'm going to get dressed up. I'm going to put on some face paint, have an amazing outfit on and really go crazy because it definitely is a place for you to kind of explore and kind of tap into some of your uh, more uh, expressive and more out there side of yourself in terms of what you wear when you go out and the attitude that you have, the way that you dance, everything around that. Just, I, I just don't have any more good words to say about it, man. So big up Inferno, big up that crew. Um, cannot wait to go to another one. And then... To continue with that, we also got another party that I want to go to, hopefully, called The Only Budokai, which is a London label and party exploring the darker side of electronic music platform, women, non-binary folk. And again, I just love being in the center of these things and seeing it with my own eyes. Even if the music isn't for me, even if fundamentally this party isn't made for me, I just love to see this next wave of kids, of people, new generation, basically dictating what club scene is going to be like. They're, like What I've seen now, what I love about it is that they're not, they're not 
they're not happy with just sitting on the sidelines and get given scraps. They're not happy with just putting on a night in a pub somewhere, like I mentioned before. They want to operate and they want to be able to showcase what they can do on the same platform as all the other kind of commercial DJing events or whatever it may be, right? Or dance music events. And for the most part, once they do them at that level, people usually think, you know what? This is a maybe my vibe, but I rate this. And that's what usually you come away from it from. That's why I come away from it from when I go to like a possession party, right? That music isn't always for me, that hardcore, trancey, whatever sort of vibe. But when you go there, you can't deny it's pretty awesome to see thousands of kids, especially kids, but especially when it comes to possession party, they're way younger than I am way cooler than I am, absolutely going mental for this music and loving every single moment of it, right? Loving it. Dressed to the nines, looking really cool, smoking cigarettes and shit, doing bumps of ket on the dance floor. You're like, wow, man, you guys are cool as fuck. Do you know what I mean? And it's cool to see because you want to see the next generation take this thing forward a bit more. The last thing you want to see 10 years on is fucking Solomon headlining more shows in places again. It's like, God damn it, man, enough. Give the kids space. But of course, they're not going to give people space because it makes sense. You know, he's obviously, you know, he used to feed his family. But I'm also happy these spaces are also giving them space to do their events. So the next Budokai is meant to be at E1, the 18th or the 12th. So again, if you're around London and you want to see what's going on in the quote-unquote alternative side of London nightlife and you want to maybe see a more... Because no, let's not alternative life. Let's say, in my opinion, these events are probably more representative of London dance music scene then all those big nights that they put on the, you know, these big fest these big festivals and big club nights, in my opinion. Because that stuff is one stuff, but I think in terms of actually illustrating what the club scene is like in London, I think these events are better because number one, the crowd is way more different. Number two, well, different and varied. Number two, the DJs playing are probably going to play the same stuff those guys play with their own little touch, right? So maybe it's going to be techno, but maybe with a sprinkling or whatever stuff that they're into, maybe some, you know, maybe some cyber pop, whatever it may be. They're going to sprinkle whatever personality they have into the sets too. So it's going to be a further extension of what you already known and heard and what you're used to kind of done through the prism of this new generation who are obviously, you know, uh, highlighting and platforming and identifying with marginalized groups groups that maybe not so over you know identified <clears throat> in a clubbing space and whatnot it's cool to see man i can't deny it. i absolutely love it um next we move on from that one we got this i got blow my nose actually because my nose is going mad so if you listen to this podcast please forgive me i haven't taken my heavy tablets either so let me take those two before i proceed I on, honestly, um, that subscription thing on flipping Amazon that you do, where you basically, if you buy pills, you can have a good month subscription. Where as long as you got money in your account, they just they just come in every, you know, whatever day of the month is a godsend because <laughs> I've not had to buy none of these flipping anti allergy tablets again. Do you know what I mean? I've I just kind of you know had these on had these on the round and they just keep coming, coming, coming. So as long as I remember to take them, I'm fine. Ah, there you go. So hopefully, I shouldn't be clogged up anymore. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Anyway, move on. Move on, move on, move on. I went to quickly talk about my guy, Jussie Smollett. The trial of the century is happening right now. I think there's going to be back-to-back -back trials, actually. There's going to be the Jussie Smollett trial is going to conclude. And then soon after, the Megan Thee Stallion v. Tory Lanez trial should be starting, too. So we're going to have a conclusion to both, to, to two very interesting stories that happened in the last two years that kind of, you know, dominated social media and had people debating as to who was telling the truth or not, right? Um, the Justice Smollett one is super interesting because on paper, it looks like he did lie, right? So the idea behind it also, the the thinking behind it goes, he was going through a lull in his career. Um, he was trying to reinvigorate it somehow by making himself go viral and by obviously making himself a victim and then using that to obviously propel himself to be a, an advocate on activists or some regard. And he plotted this plan with these two hench Nigerian brothers um, to uh, stage an attack as he was leaving a Subway sandwich shop um, somewhere near wherever he was staying in Chicago. And the idea was that they were going to beat him, you know, blood and red and blue, wherever it may be, right? Leave him some bruises, uh, tie a noose around his neck, scream out manga country, run off 
and then he was going to use that occasion to then kind of piggyback off the kind of racial tension and political unrest that was going on at the time because Donald Trump was president and basically say, oh, these MAGA guys came and beat me up because I'm a gay black guy in living in flipping America. Cool, right? And at the on paper, it doesn't seem like a bad idea given what we know about victimhood, given what we know about the politics now at the moment, given what we know about people's need to kind of identify with uh, a cause uh, pe given people's need to be seen as being more than just an actor or whatever it may be it does seem quite logical but then obviously as time has progressed what has been interesting to me about this whole case has been justice Smollett's kind of insistence that he's innocent like he has not swayed from his belief that the attack happened it wasn't a hoax and that he is a victim of a hate crime. He hasn't swayed from it at all. From the beginning to the end, he has not swayed one bit. Even from the cringy performance he did um, post, the, uh, post the assault where he was like, oh, I'm the gay Tupac, to him appearing on that TV show interview with that lady, he has not really deviated from the fact that he genuinely believes that he was attacked and in a hate crime because Donald Trump was basically stoking these racial tension fires, whatever was going on at the time. He genuinely believes that. And even in court now at the moment, because the court case is happening, he has stuck with it, which has made me think, what if, right? What if Justy Smollett is actually telling the truth? What if it actually did happen the way he said it happened? What if everything that transpired, even though it's all coincidental, which I don't believe in, right? When it comes to entertainers or when it comes to people in the world in general, <coughs> I, don't believe in I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in, sorry, in coincidences. I believe things can happen by chance. <coughs> Sorry. One of occasions, right? One of instances can happen by chance. But I usually think whatever happens after the fact is definitely someone taking advantage of a chance encounter. For instance, if there are two single people in Hollywood who happen to be spotted at a restaurant together and then the tabloids go crazy for it, the social media pages go crazy for it, all the stand accounts go crazy for it, I will not, it will not be... Uh, it would not be far-fetched to say or to suggest that maybe both agents of these two um, stars decide to sit down and say, you know what, why don't we hook these guys up and make them have a relationship so that they can boost both of their careers, which is then going to allow us to take more of a percentage as managers. I think probably the same thing happened with, you know, again, bad example, but I think probably the same thing happened with the Shawn Mendes and Camila Cabello, right? Most likely, they were spotted together kind of by chance or maybe they were in the same vicinity the fans of the stands went crazy. They looked so cute together. I'm go so hot. What a couple, what a couple. And then the label or the management team just leaned into it. So that's not really a coincidence technically, but they've kind of capitalized on it, which is why I don't believe in it fundamentally. So I think if you're a Hollywood star, like, um, you know, Justice Mullet at that time, maybe, you know, not the biggest Hollywood star, but you're kind of coming up in the ranks. You're an empire. People like you. He did an interview on The Breakfast Club before the whole attack, which I really enjoyed. He came across really well, really funny, clearly a talented actor. His sister's also a really good actor too, right? It comes from a really, um, you know, creative, it looks like a talented group of people. Um, cool, doing his thing. It wouldn't be far-fetched to suggest that he maybe he would want to do such a thing, right? It wouldn't be too far-fetched. Um, but, his insistence that he's innocent is making me believe that maybe that wasn't a fact. But Jesus, just a quickly, before we go on with this, right? Mate, stress of life definitely tells on your skin, in it, in your face. There's no getting away from it. Because look how weathered he looks from this picture, which obviously looks like it's got taken recently, where he's kind of leaving the courtroom, to this picture, which was, I think, at the beginning of the case when he was trying to fight it and come up, you know, be strong or whatnot. He looks very, very weathered. Like, his eyes are already sunken in. His hair looks like it's thinning and graying out. God damn, he's going through it. But yeah, I don't know, man. Maybe Jesse might be innocent. And if he is, he is not going to shut up about it, innit? If he's unbearable now, Imagine how unbearable he's going to be if he's able to prove to everybody that he was actually telling the truth and this was actually an attack that he didn't plan or stage in any way. Anyway, let's go on with the case. Quickly go over the, <coughs> the, the notes. So this guy called Matt Finn on, on Instagram, sorry, on Twitter, sorry, is um, basically documenting the entire court case. His Twitter handle is Matt Finn, F-N-C, all one word, Matt Finn, F-N-C, Matt spelled M-A-T-T-F-I-N-N, FNC, all one word on Twitter. Follow me, he's got a good profile in terms of everything. So he basically catalogued Judge Smollett's, um, you know, interpretation of the events and basically how he's testifying. So this is the following. Justice Smollett testifies that he and Bola Osendario got private room in a gay bathhouse and did more drugs and made out there was touching. Hey, sounds like a good time to me. 
I don't think this is an aspect that we uh, we ever knew about. I think beforehand, I think we just all assumed it was a staged hoax thing. But I don't think any of us knew that those guys were maybe involved in some gay sex fun stuff. We didn't know that at all. So that's an interesting development. So that makes it more layered because there was clearly emotions and feelings that got involved with this case too. It wasn't just clearly a point of them he just hiring out. It wasn't just a case of him hiring the biggest and buffest dudes he could find and then just telling him to beat him up. Obviously, they had some sort of connection, some sort of kind of uh, prior relationship that kind of would make it the case that they would maybe even have the ability to do it in the first place. Um, it continues to... <laughs> you got to love it, man. This is your yeah, Smollett testifies he would pay Bola or Sandario for cocaine around $200, man. What what a good time, isn't it? When, when, when people are paying you for your, your kind of... Uh, Workout tips in Coke. That's when you know you're a real degenerate. And he continues on. Says Smollett testifies that Lee Daniels, creator of Empire, told him he was fat. Smollett then was told to lose weight for a music video. This was getting set up. This was setting up Smollett's training for Osandario's meal plans, workout plans. So he's testifying basically. The only reason why they were in communication was because the rigors of the Hollywood industry was pushing him to the point where he needed to lose weight for these future roles. And his best friend or a guy that he would call a mentor, the guy that was at the center of saying, I believe him. And he was crying on camera and shit. Lee Daniels, the same guy who ran off with flipping Dame Dash's one million until he had to confront him in some sort of church somewhere. He was the guy that basically pressured him into that place. So he's in a roundabout way trying to blame Hollywood and the pressures of the entertainment industry for him being in the situation. It feels like a bit. It feels like. But again, maybe I'm wrong. It continues. It says, Smollett testifies he was at home when the Empire called him um, to tell him and an egregious letter was sent to himself. They were going to call the police. Smollett says he drove to the studio to see himself in person. Of course, that's the other bit. A letter got sent to him. I think someone put it in those kind of weird um, cut up letter thing, you know, calling him a fag, calling him, you know, a nigger. You know, the standard kind of nonsense people send. It continues here. It says, Smollett testifies his face was very important, that he looked like a black Gary Grant testifies computers were used to remove face cars what who's gary grant and why does he think he looks like him who's this gary grant guy gary grant come on oh this fucking computer is going to be the death of me who the hell is gary grant can we see who gary grant is please let's see i'm going to highlight this search it on google and see who gary see who this guy or see who because hollywood does this to a lot right when you're coming up new they'll tell you you're this person you're the next this you're the next that um but you're not right you're just about you oh my god come on this guy looks nothing like gary grant what the fuck is this <laughs> whoa he looks absolutely nothing like this don nothing like him whatsoever this dude's smoldering super handsome he's probably the kind of guy in the movies in the 70s or the 60s would slap a woman if she spoke out of line right looks nothing like him whatsoever God almighty, man, division. But it's also, it's, a, it's an incredibly gay reference too. That he even knows who this guy is, right? And that he used him as a muse to kind of build upon his, his own career. That shows you that that's a very, very gay reference. Like, what? Gary Grant? What are you talking about, Mike G? Let's continue. Um, Smollett testifies it became a running joke that, Bos that Bolo Osandario was his security when they'd go out. Defense urges brothers wanted to scare Jussie into hiring him as security. Oh, Jesus Christ. Come on. So Smollett testifies he did not want Empire Security because he liked to drive his own car and smoke my blunt in my car on my lunch. Oh, just such a nigger vibe, innit? Um, just Smollett said, under oath, there was no hoax. He maintained. Smollett says he was driving, smoking a blunt and texting with a woman about MSBC appearances the day of January 27th when the Bolo Sundarios were in his car. The brothers said that there was a hoax and he was being planned. So he's basically saying that he was driving him around just as a boy doing the ting, passing blunts around, you know, jacking each other off, doing bumps and shit. Whereas they are saying that that run or that drive was a dry run for the actual hoax, that they were driving around the area, they were, they were kind of casing, <laughs> casing out the subway, telling him, you know, what, what, where they were going to hit him, where they were going to pick him up, all that sort of stuff. But he's saying, no, 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 we were jacking each other off. You know what I mean? That's what the boys do in the car. <laughs> Just as Smollett testifies that Bola Osandario called him the night of the attack to talk about Smollett's training and meal plan. Smollett says to Bola told him he had to eat four <laughs> eggs. So Smollett talks about going to walk to get eggs. Yo, this case is wild. Who do you believe? Do you believe, right, that the call was about talking about the hoax or talking about the, you know, alleged hate crime? Or do you believe the call in the middle of the night 
was to remind my man to go buy four eggs. Somebody's lying there. Somebody had a boner when they were... Do you think both of these guys didn't have boners when they were calling each other? Do you think they both weren't pleasuring yourself when they were calling each other over the phone? Do you think they'll just go off the phone and say, yeah, brother, just get the, get the four eggs, try and buy the one with six in it so you can have a couple of more for the next day? Come on, bruv. What, what, are, they, what are they doing here? So when it testifies... Um, sorry, da, da, da. Uh, Smart testifies that it felt like Looney Tunes when he was attacked. Somebody massive came up to me, not even time to think. Oh yeah, that's why he's saying that how he didn't, he couldn't see who it was because they were completely masked up. I don't know about you, right? I don't know about you guys, but I have a feeling <clears throat> if I was <clears throat> if I was getting beaten up by somebody in the street and it had, 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 had a banner clover and they covered up as much as they can on their body, I would still have a sense of what race they were just based off how they moved or some sounds they made. I don't know, maybe because I'm from the hood and I've grown up around stuff and I've had to keep my head in the swivel and had to be street smart. But I just have a genuine feeling that I'll be able to tell if the kid was Somali, if he was Polish, right? Romanian, Caribbean, Jamaican, Trinidadian. I'll be able to tell. I swear, I swear down. I'll be able to tell. I don't know about you, but I would, I would tell. I would be able to tell. As I'm fighting for my life, right? Trying to avoid my stab wounds. I'll be able to tell. I swear my life I would. I swear it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm going over the top, but I swear I would. It continues. It says, um, Smollett testifies if I lean to says, because I was getting my ass whooped, Smollett response when asked why he did it and she realized noose around his neck. <laughs> he was getting beaten so bad he didn't realize someone putting a noose around his neck. Continues. He says, I'm a black man in America. I do not trust the police. Smollett under oath said, Ah, that's the same thing Megan the Stallion said, isn't it? Why didn't you call the police? Oh, because he's a black man. I didn't want to get him in trouble. And then the next day, you shot me, Tori, you shot me. You can't have to pick your lane. Either you're the victim or you're, or you're the freedom fighter, but you can't be both. Let's, let, let's pick one. Um, Smollett's manager, Frank Granson, did call the police. Uh, Smollett testifies under oath. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so that's the weird thing, isn't it? So he got beaten up. He got put a noose around his neck, which, again, if that did happen, that's incredibly degrading. He takes it off. Then he goes back to his hotel room. And he manages to put it back on again so the police can see it. <laughs> they, oh, again, <clears throat> one thing I've discovered about this stuff, being famous sucks because the things you have to do, the things you have to think about when you're famous or you're an entertainer is so disgusting. In the moment of need, in the moment you're feeling vulnerable, you're feeling violated, you're feeling humiliated, you have to think about how it looks to the media, how it looks to the police, how it looks to the wider public. That's what you have to think about. You have to already get your response in hand, where you're going to tweet out, where you're going to go and talk. It's just like exhausting. You can't even sit down and collect your thoughts. You just got your ass handed to you. You got guys shouting fag, calling you MAGA, saying MAGA country, saying get out of my country N-word. All this mass stuff they're saying to you. You can't even have a chance to kind of collect yourself and just think, oh my God, what the hell is happening? You have to already think about the next steps. Put the noose over your neck. Put this. I said, oh yeah, yeah. Being famous sucks so bad. It continues. It says, um... Uh, Smollett testified during the investigation that he got a text from Don Lemon. Oh, Don Lemon's involved the two, saying the CPD didn't believe him. Chicago Police Department, okay. Um, Smollett on Chicago. Oh, is, is Don Lemon from there? Or did he, how did he know that? Interesting. So they didn't believe him from the start, I guess it was. Which I guess makes sense, right? Because if you, again, it, it, in a state like Chicago, a lot of violence happens there, right? So I'm pretty sure those police officers on the beat are able to ascertain the validity of people's claims pretty quickly in, an, in, in a kind of, you know, whatever happened domestic history they're able to kind of figure out who's the aggressor who isn't yeah you know i mean quite quick because there's so many case studies you have to kind of come across on a daily basis so it wouldn't surprise me if they thought you know what there's something fishy about this shit from the onset it continues it said um smollett testified he turned down alicia key's invite to get on stage during grammys because he wanted to get up there as a singer not as a singer that would beat up come on jesse you know more likely than not, unless he's found completely innocent of all charges, he's never going to be on a Grammy stage again anyway in his career. He should have taken that chance. I never understand these people who run towards victimhood and when they get given all the treats and the rewards of victimhood, they then try and turn it away like they tr to try and be like moral, ethical people like, no, I've, you know, I stand for more than that. No, you don't. You've decided to be the victim. Ride that baby until the cow come home ride that horse into the sunset as megan the Stallion did she decided to be a victim she got grammys she didn't deserve she got free grammys i was like come on man megan the Stallion is an all right artist but does she deserve free grammys let's be real right makes mediocre music performances are pretty dead just looks great in pictures for the most part but she ride that thing to the cows come home so even if she does get found out that she did lie about tori so what 
She's packed in her money. She's got her accolades. And she could still run back to the victimhood stuff and say, oh, yeah, it's half of black women out here, blah, 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 blah. I don't know why he was doing this, that whole stance. He should have just taken the, the gig at the Grammys and used it as another thing to kind of, you know, launch himself and kind of give some money in his pocket or whatever it may be. <clears throat> he continues here, says, um, Smollett under oath says, I have a scar under my eye that was not healed. My injuries were real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Special prosecutor, so Smollett says, do you recall the Northwest doctor? Was that witness actually called by your attorney? And your doctor said, no injuries. <laughs> he said, yeah, I remember him saying the facial injuries were real. So he's disputing it. The doctor said his injuries weren't real or they weren't as aggressive or as you know crazy as making it seem which makes sense as well if i've just if if i've been to a bathhouse with you you know we've been doing bumps of coke we've been smoking weed we've been jacking each other off it's very difficult for me to then get up the rage needed to really bang you up even if it is for a hoax that's going to probably make us both rich it's going to be hard for me to really let loose on you because we were boys, man. We just jacked each other off the other day. We jacked each other off. We did a couple of bumps. We smoked some weed. We watched some gay porn and some bathhouse thing. It's going to be difficult for me to come in and start beating you. It's going to be hard because there's love there. You know what I mean? So it's no surprise that his injuries weren't as extensive as you probably hope it would be. You probably hope to have a big black eye. Look like he'd been in a fight with Francis and Ghana, right? Looking at those guys. That's what he wanted. But instead, he looked like he just got in a bit of a tussle in, in a flipping Black Friday sale. That's not enough for you to kind of say you are the black Tupac. I'm sorry, you're the gay Tupac, sorry. Oh, what a legend. Justice Smollett is rescheduled to retake the standard. Then let's continue on and I'll end it. So he said, yeah, uh... What else is said here? I want to end it quickly here. Yeah, this is a funny bit. Smollett interrupts Special Prosecutor Dan Webb as Webb was reading out loud Smollett's messages that had the N-word in it. So she's reading his texts, I guess, back and forth to the guys, to the brothers or whatever, just his texts in general. And he said the following. Smollett said, can you spell or say the N-word out respect from every African-American in this room? You've been saying that word a lot. Webb says, I don't intend to, to, I don't intend to do that sort of you can read your messages aloud. Smollett then reads his own messages. <laughs> so if anything, right, this should be a great example of the grandstanding and the ego that exists when you're a Hollywood entertainer, man. Like, like his life is on the line, literally. His career is on the line, literally. But still, he feels the need to aggrandize, to grandstand, to morale, to, to flipping virtue signal that this lady or this prosecutor shouldn't be saying the N-word because it's written in the text, because you're offending the years and decades of my ancestors. Like, shut up, bruv. You're fighting for your life right now. No one cares about your politics and your, you know, woke ideals. No one cares about it right now. We're trying to ascertain as to whether or not this thing was real or it wasn't. And I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just in the minority. I'm going to end it there until reading the, the, the notes. I generally think he's saying the truth. I don't know why. A part of me thinks... It actually did happen where he says it happened. And if that is the case, whew, he will not shut the fuck up if it does, if that is the case. He won't shut the fuck up. He will not let us rest if it's, if it's kind of revealed that he actually was a victim of a hate crime. And the Olsen Dario brothers, because what he's basically alleging is that he hired them to be his trainers. And somehow within that time, they go into a disagreement and then they decided to do that whole jumping thing with the MAGA hats to kind of get back on him because, I don't know, whatever disagreement they fell out with your money. But then he, on his head, thought it was a real attack because he didn't know it was them because their banner clavered up and covered every part of their body. But again, who knows? Who knows if it was true? Who knows what's true? You know, it would also be funny. If there was actually was these white supremacist attackers, they did exist. They found them later on down the line. Like, they did exist. It wasn't actually the Boston Road brothers or somebody else, but that, is, that isn't going to be the case because we already, we already see footage of them buying a noose, you know, whatever, ordering a hat off, flipping Amazon. Do you remember when that hat was so toxic? That hat really made people upset. Now you wear that hat, it's, it's a bit of an LOL, but do you remember that hat was a big deal if you wore that Make, and Make, a great, Make America Great Again hat? That was a really big deal. Like, you were basically signaling that you were a racist and a homophobe or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just a hat. Hey, Donald Trump's presidency was the most divisive presidency of all time, innit? It really, really was. But things haven't even got better, really, it looks like, in America, to be honest. But again, no politics talk. Let's end it there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think Justice Millet is innocent? Yes or no? Is he telling the truth? Yes or no? Or do you have any alternative theories too? I want to hear those. Any alternative theories that haven't really made the mainstream? Let me know. I'd love to hear them, man. I really, really would. But yeah, that's the Excellent English episode number 524. Sorry, it's again, it's a short one because like I've said before, I'm going to a Christmas party. So definitely... 
definitely get back to you on the other side. Of course, definitely can record one later. Just in terms of content, I've got a live stream coming up for UFC 269 on Saturday. So if you're around, definitely tune into that on my YouTube channel. Um, obviously, the Patreon episode for the podcast will be available for my Patreon subscribers at the end of the week, hopefully on Saturday. So make sure you tune back on there. If you're not subscribed already, make sure you do subscribe at patreon.com for just Agostino. Links should be in the description down below. Or if you listen to the podcast, you should see in the description too. And then apart from that, also have a DJ live stream coming up on Friday. So check that out too if you want to check that out. It should be around. I'm going to do it. I think from 9 to 11 so definitely check that out on my channel from 9 to 11 be a live dj stream playing all my stuff that i like to enjoy play disco house no probably i'll probably stick to house and techno so make sure if you like that sort of vibe house and techno vibe um test stream 59 coming at you on friday check that out but until then take care if you listen via the podcast you'll hear an outro song if you're listening if you're watching via youtube it'll end right here i'll see you guys again very soon take care be safe